And welcome everybody to the Gym Master Show Live Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series. Hope you guys are doing well today. Hope you're having a good day. We just literally got in ourselves from a beautiful day. Just a couple blocks away is the coast, the ocean, beautiful sunshine. You know, gorgeous day here, especially a good way to start the week. Wherever you're watching around the world, thanks for joining us. We really appreciate it. I'm Jim Masters, your host. This is our Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show Series, bringing back the Lost Art of Conversation. Warm, fun, inspiring conversations. We always have amazing guests that come in from all backgrounds. Broadway, Hollywood, television, film, music, stage, culinary arts, sports, comedy, and all the rest, including inspiration. Last night, Loretta Swit from MASH was with us. Did you see that episode? If not, check it out. It's available in the archives. Matter of fact, over 750 episodes of our series are available for your perusal and enjoyment right here on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. We say hello to the JMS Loverty family, our faithful who watch all the time. They spread the joy. They share the links on their social media. And uh, they've been with us, a lot of them, since day one when we launched our series. We welcome them. We welcome all of you. If this is your first time watching, thanks for being with us here on the Gym Master Show Live. We hope you find something of interest and uh, you stick with us and join us uh, daily when we do these shows, which is about seven days a week live, which is incredible. Uh, we have some wonderful opportunities for you. If you would like to comment during the show, maybe we'll sprinkle some of your comments on the screen. Uh, if you wanna chat amongst yourselves, what we do here, since this is like a television series playing off my TV and radio background, I like to do it in, the form of a television show. So instead of the fact that we, you know, we don't have necessarily a studio audience in front of us here. So our viewers watching around the world can comment in our JMS Levity chat room. You can also comment on the YouTube channel underneath all the episodes. And you're like our studio audience. You're welcome to interact with the show when the show is live. You're also welcome to interact with the show when the show is not live. You can leave a comment on our YouTube channel and all the episodes. But if you would like to comment right now, say hello to each other. A lot of our lovely viewers like to say hello to each other. We have a JMS Lovety chat room that's open and available for you right now. When you subscribe to our YouTube channel, which costs nothing, Jim Masters TV is the YouTube channel. You get to be a part of our JMS Lovety squad and you get to comment amongst yourselves, say hello to each other. And we might even throw a comment or two on the screen as well. So, Lots we do with all of you because we I like to be an interactive host and uh, celebrate our viewers as much as our guests and all of us. You know, it takes a village to put everything together. So again, welcome, welcome, welcome to the show. We're also really excited to welcome a fantastic guest. Uh, he's coming to us actually on location from beautiful Fire Island, Long Island, New York. Uh, you guys know I'm originally from Long Island, New York, from out east. And uh, we're here in the New York area, southern New England coast between New York and Boston. Beautiful day here. And I'm sure a beautiful day where our guest is coming from, Fire Island. James Gavin is here. Have you ever read any of his works? They are extraordinary. I'm so excited to have him here on the show. Acclaimed author, journalist, biographer. He is really prolific when it comes to writing material that really engages people. It's something he's been doing for a long time called a killer biographer in the Hollywood reporter. James Gavin is the author of four claimed books and dozens of New York times features. He's a worldwide public speaker, Grammy nominee and recipient of two ASCAP Deems Taylor Virgil Thomas awards for excellence in music journalism. His fifth book, George Michael, a life, yeah, it just came out in June, has been hailed as the definitive telling of the tumultuous life story of the troubled pop superstar. People chose it as one of its top 10 summer reads. The New York Times called it engrossing, a thorough and well-rounded view of Michael's artistry and personal chaos. USA Today termed it probing and definitive. In her New York Times review of James Gavin's previous book is that All There Is, The Strange Life of Peggy Lee, Anita Gates called the biography eminently readable, fascinating, suspenseful, musically detailed, and insightful. The Hollywood Reporter's Tam Apello chose it as one of the top 10 music books of 2014. Stormy Weather is another incredible book that James has penned, The Life of Lena Horne. We'll talk about that one, as well as his very first, Intimate Nights, The Golden Age of of New York Cabaret. 
Manhattan-born graduate of Fordham University, James is a much-published freelance journalist. Aside from the New York Times, he's written for Vanity Fair, Time Out New York, and The Daily Beast. His 2015 feature for Jazz Times, The Gates of the Underworld Inside Slug Saloon, Jazz's most notorious nightclub, earned him his second ASCAP Deems Taylor Virgil Thompson Award, and he has contributed as well liner notes to over 500 CDs. And his essay for the GRP box set, Ella Fitzgerald, The Legendary Decca Recordings, was nominated for a Grammy Award. Here are some of the books, just to show you, run them through here quickly. This is the newest one that everybody's talking about. And I know you guys, you're very proactive. When we talk about things that you can get access to, I know you you go right to websites, you order stuff right away. You're going to want to get this one. It is a, a definite read, George Michael, A Life. As I mentioned earlier, if you loved Peggy Lee, as I always have as well, is that all there is? You're going to want to add this to your collection. Stormy Weather, Lena Horn, another incredible one. This one too, The Long Night of Chet Baker, Deep in a Dream. And I mentioned this one as well, Intimate Nights, another fantastic one. It's really amazing. And uh, all of them are. And let's welcome James to the show because we have so much to talk about. And we're so excited to welcome him as we celebrate his work, but also that new book, about George Michael, a life. James, welcome to the show, live and direct from Fire Island, New York. How are you, my friend? Well, I'm better now that you've heaped all of that praise upon me. Jim, it's interesting to hear <laughs> all of those credits that you just listed from my bio, which are spread out in my life over many years, of course. Yes. And then when you compress them all into a few paragraphs, it does make my life sound rather fabulous, doesn't it? I cannot Isn't deny. it though? <laughs> <laughs> well, but fabulous. Wait, before we, Jim, before we get into it, I've, I've got to ask you, the setting that you're in is fascinating. me. It is so 60s. It's very day glow, lava lamp looking, and, and it is high. How did you create that backdrop? It all came together little by little. I, I, I'm pulling off my background working in television, you know, and broadcast and film and stage. So little by little, uh, what we actually did is we took various lamps and different things that we had, and then we sort of created this whole look and it has sort of morphed. Uh, it changes based on holiday time, a Christmas tree ends up coming in right about here and it gets very festive. Uh, St. Patrick's, it's all green and I'm all green and sweaters with hats, birthday celebrations and, and all kinds of things that it, it changes its look. Valentine's Day, the whole thing is all red and I've got a red velvet shirt on with a martini. So we, <laughs> it's, uh, it's interchangeable and has been morphed along the way, but thanks for, uh, paying heed and noticing uh, the attention to detail, James. <laughs> and that's my next question. And then I promise I'll turn the, the interview. I'll let you do your job. But I'm fascinated, <laughs> doubly fascinated by the caricaturist in your opening credits who does that drawing of you. I love it. Who is that? That is actually a friend of mine we hired to create the, we were looking for a logo and, you know, because a lot of people are asking for swag and things of that nature. So they were looking for T-shirts, mugs and all that. And we've been working on that. But I've, I've been so busy with my professional work that we're still working on that. But we wanted to do the show open. And I was looking for somebody to design something. And I said, well, what do you think would be good? Uh, and he said, well, I'll tell you right now that retro is in. Retro is very popular right now. I said, really? I said, okay. Because we had a show open earlier that we used for about a year that had graphics and everything. But then um, I said, okay, you know, come up with a few ideas, run them by me. And he ran them by me. We took a look at different versions and black and white versions and different iterations of this. And, um, and it was a stagnant image. And I said, well, that's fantastic. You know, this, you know, stagnant image that looks like sort of that there. Um, and I said, well, 
I would love if there's a way, because he's an illustrator, but not an animator. Is there a way, you know, I want it to come to life. I don't want it to just be a stagnant image. Is there a way we can sort of bring it to life on the screen? And he said, well, I'm, again, I'm an illustrator. Uh, as a matter of fact, as he was designing that for me, he was working on a cover of an Aerosmith album at the time. So he's, he's a really busy guy. So to be able to get him for 10 minutes was amazing. Um, I said, I would love to have it animated and have some way that it moves. He said, well, I don't animate, but my daughter does. So let me see what she can do with the image we've created that we've selected. And see if we can bring it to life. So he had her work on it. They teamed up. She animated it. The music we had already had, uh, we updated the theme with the new logo. So the music, you know, is ours. We have that. And then wanted to have the music match perfectly the flow of the open and just the way it went. And again, all playing off my background in radio and television, knowing what I want and what the look and feel was to match the vibe, positive, warm, conversational vibe of the show. So he said retro was in. We went with that design. And then she was able to uh, to bring it to life. And um, and the rest is history. <laughs> So well, retro has been in my home. And by the way, as you were speaking, I was watching these gorgeous comments. Yes, these are the Lovities. You're already a Lovity, James. Uh, I told you beforehand that uh, I said the show has a lot of light, love, and levity, and I said it too fast about a year ago. And I stumbled on the word Lovity, and the gang said, Jim, that's it. You're Mr. Levity. This is Levity Hall. We're your Levity squad. And the guests are part of the Levity family. So they are what you would consider Dick Cavett or Carson, Mervs or Mike's or Regis's studio audience <laughs> from all, all around the world. <laughs> Jim, thank you for mentioning those names because they're all important in my life. I yes. grew up on those shows. And one of yes. the things I love the most about all of those hosts is that they presented the singers that I loved or 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 came to love and in many cases i saw those singers for the first time on mike on merv on johnny on dick cabot and uh i miss i miss those shows so much i miss so that I. level i miss that level of conversation i, I miss yes. dick cabot man to get yes. his, the, the collective body of work of dick cabot and the superb taste that that man showed in documenting important figures throughout history forever. Yes. I, yes. We, I, cannot, I cannot thank Dick Cavett enough for what he gave us. Absolutely. You know, uh, that's, it wasn't I that said it was, it was a guest and viewers that have said, we're bringing back that lost art of conversation because I work in the industry. When I decided to add this to my already crazy schedule, we've done, we've done 750 plus shows in only two years live, just about seven days a week, which is beyond anything I would have expected with the interaction and everything else. And I said, if I'm going to do it, I want it to be warm, conversational. I don't even want it to seem like an interview. I want it to be a conversation where we're having a conversation over a cup of coffee. We're learning about each other. We're celebrating life. The viewers are in. They're interacting. They're having a good time as well. And we all feel like we've learned something and we've gained something from the experience, just like when you'd be immersed in, again, some of those other entertainment lifestyle of ready talk shows of the past. So pulling off that wonderful warmth and conversational style and adding a little modern vibe and modern twist to today is how we really has what my design was and what I really wanted for this particular series. And now you're a part of it. You're in the annals of history on the show and the audience has already said he's a lovety. So <laughs> You're a, now what most people say james is when the audience i say there's grammys emmys tellies tonys peabody's duponts there's all of it tellies you name it but when you get a lovety on the jim masters show live how does it make you feel most guests say their feet start tingling are your feet tingling oh. right now <laughs> no but in fact they're not touching the ground they're floating. He's floating. Perfect. <laughs> then we have done our job, gang. 
How are you and how are things in beautiful Fire Island? Great place to be right about now. I come out here and spend several weeks per summer. It's one of my special places. I have a number of special places around the world where I am at my happiest. And um, I'm in Fire Island Pines. And it's it's a Fire Island Pines is not like Provincetown, where I'm a, I'll be in another week. I love Provincetown as well, but Provincetown is a town. Fire Island is a state of mind. There's not a hell of a lot of options. There is the one of the most beautiful beaches I've ever seen. There is there are spectacular sunsets, a few places to eat out, a lot of places to take long walks, and I take my work here, and I. I luxuriate in the sounds of crickets, which you can hear all around me. Nature, nature envelops me. Uh, and although I live on the Upper West Side of New York, one block away from Central Park, and I go to Central Park every day I'm in town, uh, the isolation, the, the distance, the solitude of this place are very good for me. We're listening to those crickets, and and that's not a sound effect record, folks. Those are real crickets. He didn't hire those for sound effect background noise. That's the real deal. That's the first thing I noticed. That are you outside? That's fantastic. I said I like the fact that you're doing it outside. I mean, I could have come to Fire Island and just did the show there with you outside with the crickets. That would have been cool. Far <laughs> there. The beach is about three minutes outside of that door. I was there for hours today. Uh, it's impossible for me to relax in New York City. My life is too hectic. I'm too distracted. There are too many events. I'm not complaining about any of them. I mean, because it's, it's the life that I chose. New York City from probably for me from the age of about seven or eight years old, New York City was it. It, I grew, I was born there, adopted. I grew up in Yonkers, New York. And at the age of 22, I ran back to New York City. I miraculously found a sh an apartment share on, on the Upper West, where I still live. And uh, I just felt that I, I didn't want to ever be a small fish in a big, a, a big fish in a small pond. If I could be a small fish in the big, definitive pond of, of New York City, that to me would constitute a happy life. Mm. How does being out there inspire you? Does it inspire you to create, to write, to, to produce, or do you go there not wanting to do that, to get away from that? Do you, are you talking about Fire Island or Manhattan? Fire Island, when you're out in a place like Fire Island, does any of the naturalness of it inspire you in any way to create and write and produce? Or when you're there, do you try to shut that off and just sort of coast? Funnily enough, it's, it's, it's very easy to become a slug when you're out in a beach town <laughs> and to develop a condition known as beach brain to yes. which I am a stranger. But I work every day because I have to. And if I go to bed at the end of the night and I haven't produced something substantial, then I yeah. feel I yeah. do feel like a slug. I need to work. And I, like you, am one of the lucky ones because at a fairly early age, I found my bliss. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. followed my bliss, as Joseph Campbell recommended we do. Yes. And, yeah. uh, and, and when I was a junior at Fordham University, uh, I was taking a writing tutorial with a wonderful writer and writing professor named Verlin Klinkenberg. And I said to him one day as a junior, um, gee, it, no one has ever written a book about all those wonderful little nightclubs that used to be all over New York City. And wouldn't it be great if somebody did? And right. he said to me, why don't you? And those three words gave me my life. Wow. That was really, that was a pivotal point for you, huh? Life changing. And I recognized in that invitation, it's as though my entire life just unfurled in front of me because up until that point, 
I had all these fascinations with books, with old music, not new music, but old music. And I wanted to be a writer, but I had no idea how to do it. And in that little phrase, that little question, he, he, sh he shone a spotlight on the path that I was about to take. Now, within the family, are there other journalists, writers? Were you surrounded? Was there inspiration within the home, within the family as well? Oh, God, no. So no, you were no. the first. My father was a, rest his soul, he died in 2017. My father was a, a mechanic. He fixed cars and trucks for the telephone company. He did not graduate high school and to the very best of my knowledge, never read a book in his life. I know he didn't read my books. That didn't stop him from being proud of the fact that I had written books, but he just didn't read. My parents, uh, loving to me as they were, were not um, culturally minded. They didn't have wanderlust or intense curiosity about the world. Mine probably comes from the fact that they didn't have it. And so that said, there were things around the house that made a big impact on me. And I'm going to tell you about one of them. When I was, uh, I learned how to read when I was four years old, which was also life changing, an epiphany for me. And then the next year, when I was maybe just in kindergarten, maybe not quite, I discovered a record in the house. We didn't have a lot of records. We had a few. And one of them was a grade worn out 45 RPM of Patty Page singing the Tennessee Waltz. Mm. A lot of hit in mm. 1950. Number mm. one for weeks and weeks and weeks. And that song made a big impact on, on my little five-year-old heart because it's a terribly sad song. And I've always yeah. been most deeply connected with sad songs, much more yeah. so than happy songs. And so when you think about it, the Tennessee Waltz is a song about rejection. It's about a young woman who, um, who, who goes to a dance and introduces her best friend to her beau and the best friend steals the beau away, leaving the young woman alone. And that record, I, I get goosebumps as I think about it. It's, it's so important in my life. And that is the recording that showed me that the ways in which singers, special singers, could tell a story and touch your heart. And I knew that I was not a singer. I tried yeah. to sing along with old records and I couldn't do it. But as I discovered books and writing in a big way, I thought maybe I can do what those singers are doing, but just do it with prose. So that became my goal at a very young age. That is amazing. What is your favorite musical instrument? My favorite musical instrument is the guitar. I find the guitar to have more warmth than any other instrument. And I think part of the reason for that is that the guitar is held against your heart. And the guitar has a warmth to it that soothes yeah. me and yeah. comforts me. I'm not talking, I love rock guitar, but I'm talking about acoustic jazz guitar, bossa nova guitar, classical guitar, the things that I lean toward. Right. Uh, right. And, I, and I don't play an instrument. I never learned how to do it. I just felt that that wasn't the path for me, that I, that I, would be better off devoting my ambitions to something else. You know what my favorite, well, I'm a music person and I have thousands, we have a climate controlled storage bin that we pay monthly for that has hundreds of sealed LPs, probably a lot of the kinds of music you're talking about, reel to reel tapes, uh, CDs, albums, cassettes, all of it. And I've collected it over the years. I. I played violin when I was a kid and then moved on to guitar and doing a little with piano. But one of a sound that for me, and I get what you're saying as far as liking some of the deeper, meaningful, almost melancholy music a little bit. It just 
gets right to your heart and soul first. Not that you don't like all everything else and you're entertained and you just really enjoy the rest. Something about the other material cuts right through. Uh, there are some Christmas songs instrumentally that I hear. And the minute I hear that song, whether it's Oh Come All Ye Faithful done instrumentally or whatever it is, just because I've heard it all my life since birth. And it's something that is like a lullaby that comes back every single year. The world could be on fire all the other months, but then when Christmas comes and those songs return, a lot of the traditional songs, when they return, almost like a blanket, a comfort, there they are again. No matter what happened, the chaos, the fire and fury of the last 11 and a half months, those songs are back to greet you and comfort and provide hope and love and all the rest. Those songs will do a lot for me as well as instrumental music that has some of this texture that you're talking about. I had a conversation with somebody I interviewed, and I mentioned that on this show a couple of times, um, with a cellist that I interviewed who had graduated from Juilliard. And it wasn't on this show. It was on my professional work on television. And I said, I'm going to throw this out there. It may sound left field, but maybe you'll get it. I mean, you live and breathe music. So I'll throw it out there. And I just want to see what you get from what I say. I say, when I hear the cello for some reason, it stops me. I can hear the warm, deep, melancholy tones of that cello, and it will stop traffic for me. Uh, I will always pick that instrument out. I'll always hear the instrument. I'll always feel what that instrument is trying to say. And I said, for some reason, if I was to ever be able to give the human heart a sound that an instrument made, for some reason for me, that warmth of that deep cello would be the instrument. And he said, ah, Jim, makes total sense. I said, really? You get what I'm saying? And he said, absolutely. He said, because there's a tonality and the sound of the cello is an instrument that is the closest, if not one of the, to the sound of the human voice. And that's why when you hear that cello, you're humanizing it. You're thinking of, of childhood and family time and happiness and loss and sad and ha all these emotions will come to you when you hear that warm, deep sound of the cello. And that's, <laughs> that's what the cello sometimes does for me. And it was just so cool that, uh, that the cellist got what I was talking about. <laughs> oh, of course he did. I just saw a comment uh, scroll by by a gentleman named John Ways. And he asked oh, yes, me what John, it is about. Yes. Yeah, he asked me what it is about sad songs that resonate so deeply with me. And, and I would say things were not so great in my growing up. My, my father drank for many years and my mother had her hands full with my father and the atmosphere in the house was strange and tense a lot of the time. And that is why these voices on records became like my friends. It, it astonished me that Joe Stafford, there's a Joe Stafford album that I grew up with called I'll Be Seeing You from 1958, mm -hmm. gorgeously arranged by her great arranger husband, Paul Weston. And it's yeah, an album of, yeah, it's an album of sad World War II songs. And I discovered that album when I was about 11 years old. And that is why, because of the atmosphere around my house, that's the reason why sad songs spoke to me as they did. A few years after that, well, I was enamored of June Christie because June Christie had deep sadness in her voice. She was considered to be a cool singer in the Anita O'Day tradition, but that wasn't June at all. June right. had great heartbreak and humanity in her singing. And June Christie recorded an album called This Time of Year, which was mm -hmm. June's Christmas album, a whole album of original songs written by a couple who lived in the San Fernando Valley, I think, named... 
oh Lord, I'm blanking on their names. Uh, it will come to me. Uh, Arnold Pierce and Connie Miller are their names. And they wrote an a set of original Christmas songs for June. And there's, it's no wonder this album tanked. I think it was only available for one Christmas in 1960 or 61. Anyway, this is an album that, that gets to the heart of what's so rough about Christmas a lot of the times. It, it, it delves into, yeah, it delves into all the layers, the conflicting feelings that, that Christmas brings upon us. And this album, No Christmas for Me would be complete without it. There are other ones that I love. I love yeah. the, th the three Julie Andrews Christmas albums arranged oh, yeah. by Ian yeah. Fraser. Those albums to me are like Christmas snow globes, turning over a Christmas snow globe and seeing the little snow fall down and you're inside that little, that, that Edwardian scene. And uh, those albums touch my heart. Doris Day's yeah. Christmas album. Yeah. I, I, I love Carole. all of Andy Williams' albums too. Oh, great. Robert Goulet, yeah. great Christmas yeah. album. Great Christmas yeah. album. So, but anyway, all of the this music touches my heart, and that yes. is that's what I require in music. I need to to be touched. Yes, very interesting. You're saying that. I don't know. This is a James thing or something. But uh, for me, and folks, we will be getting to his books. But this is rich what we're doing here, <laughs> and it's automatic. That's why I call these conversations. We don't script this. Um, I've always, even when I was a kid, and I will admit that still I have trouble, no matter what it is, I still have trouble going to sleep on Christmas Eve. I'm still like a kid. It's this anticipation. For me, because of, I guess, the way our Christmases have always been and, and, and still are with the family, the folks, parents, and all the relatives who have a lot of family, a lot of relatives, cousins, aunts, and uncles, the whole was always and still is like this grand thing and a lot of attention has gone into it and it starts early um, with things being homemade and created and, and, you know, crafted and all of these things building up to that glorious day. So for me, Christmas even more than my own birthday. Some people love their birthday the most. That's, believe it or not, even though it's an important day for me, <laughs> it's not my favorite day. My favorite has been Christmas Day because of the way it was always lovingly gifted to us by our family. Our parents made sure that things were always loving and warm and all the relatives would come over and all of that. But like you said, which I, I'm tuning into, which I think is really cool, all those sensations that are touched upon on that day. Like one of the reasons why for me it's been such a, an incredible day is the fact that you have everything touched upon. You have your sense of smell with the pine tree and the pine cones and the pumpkin pie. You have, there's gifts given and received there's hopefully love, there's food, there's a beautiful table filled that's decorated to the nines. People are tending to be dressed up and happy. There's the music wafting through the house, but music that's building up for several weeks leading up to this day. There's uh, God and religion and church, if you're following that. There's the Christmas specials, the Christmas movies, there's the lights, there's possibly the snow. It's like every sense that we have the ability to tap into is being tapped into. And it's such a, like for me, a plug-in day. But I've always hated the day after <laughs> because everything is so on on christmas day you're at the table and the relatives and the uncle with the pipe and the sweater and the the laughter and the children running around and all of it all of it it's fantastic and then the next day <laughs> people are returning gifts in the return aisle people road rage is back the music stopped 
and you're i'm like huh can't we <laughs> let's can't we make this a little bit longer <laughs> So for me, Christmas has always yeah. been just this uh, day where like everything is so plugged in for me with all the music, the food, the gifts, the happiness, the love, the kindness, and hopefully all those things. It, it doesn't always happen for everybody, but because I've been exposed to it early, those are the things that we've, we continue and um, it's like an ultimate day, but I've never liked the day after. <laughs> Even as a kid, I would be quiet the day after not depressed but sort of like wow why can't it be like that more often or just every day or just you know <laughs> if we can make that day like yeah. that oh god how well I, I i understand what you're saying we stretched it out in my house and the christmas tree stayed up until after the first of the year that's but what that we was did. when yes. i was yeah, that's when I was the happiest, too. For the whole month of December, the Christmas tree went up the day after Thanksgiving. And Christmas was the time when I felt the most loved. My mother and father heaped presents upon me. It was almost as though they were making up for some of the darker things that went on during the year. And I, I, the, the, the tingle that I felt of opening up present after present after present. I'm going to tell you one brief story, and it will actually be a good segue into my books because it'll explain why I have chosen the subjects that I've chosen. And you and I will have I to was continue this conversation years. off the air at some point because it's cool. I think we're kindred spirits in a lot of ways here. <laughs> I would love it. I would love it. Well, in that, I was 14 years old, and two singers that I already loved dearly, June Christie and Chris Connor, both of whom were, were promoted in the 1950s as being cool and hip, West yeah. Coast jazz singers, Beach and Sun, although Chris was, yeah. New, Chris was New York, but she was part of that Anita O'Day Cool School. Both of these women lapsed into severe alcoholism. And they were drinking a lot. June was mostly her, her, her drinking. But they each made albums, new al albums for the first time in years around the late 70s. And I saw those copies of those albums at Sam Goody's and Cross County Shopping Center. And I asked my mother and father if they would buy them for me. And so um, they did. I knew they were going to do it. And a few days before Christmas, the presents were all unwrapped and under the tree. And I got up in the middle of the night. This package containing these two LP records was way in the back against the wall. And I went, I tiptoed into the kitchen and took a butter knife and made my way under the tree. And I burrowed my way through the presents and quietly, so there'd be no rustling, I took that a package with the albums and I just used the butter knife to, to pop the adhesive tape just so I could hold and look at these two terribly sad albums that these women had made. June was kind of a wreck. Chris was kind of a wreck. And yet those albums, this gives you a sense of what I was pumping into my teenage head. So Anyway. Have you ever been told there's this kind of cool and then we'll move on to some of the other cool things that you're doing, of course. Uh, sure. I've heard and I mentioned this a couple of times, uh, I think on this show, but I've actually mentioned it to a lot of colleagues and family and friends and others. And I just match. a matter of fact, I just interview, I interviewed somebody, an expert on radio earlier today in my professional world. And we were in this conversation because she does this kind of work. But um I said, you know, I keep hearing three things that people keep saying to me and it's not solicited. And these are people at ex expert levels that don't even know each other and don't even know each other keeps saying this. And they keep pointing out three things. And I was co-hosting this television show with my female colleague and we had some downtime on set and she's very into um, psychology and mindset and emotional intelligence and i love all of that too and we were having some really good 
downtime, deep conversations in between cameras rolling. And she said this uh, same thing too. And I'm thinking, I'm talking to somebody who might also be a mirror image of this, just picking the vibes up I'm getting from you, James. I keep being described as three things, which I kind of like the more I explore them because they're things that now I can not label because I don't like labels, but I can use as definitions for things I've always felt since childhood. They keep saying, Jim, you really need and like to and revel in feeling things. One of the questions that I always ask in any conversation really first, and it's a friend of mine, we were on a train coming back from the city to New England. And she said, gee, you know, you always ask this and your, your sister's the same way. You always ask why first. I said, I know. And I'm trying to deduce why I say why. And I think it's because when I ask why, there's feeling. The what, when, who, where, and how we can figure out later. That's the nuts and bolts. But the why, what, why, what motivate you? Why, why did you think that, say that, do that, choose to do that, not do that? So I need to feel it. So it turns out that these people keep saying, you operate from a higher consciousness. You see color vividly. You notice rainbows constantly and you notice shadows of the sun setting and you're like on, you're visual and your eyes are like cameras soaking it all up. You are, and these are people really involved in that world expert people who have said this, you operate from a higher consciousness. You hear music more deeply, things touch you more deeply. You're also highly intuitive and a high level empath. You feel a lot of what's going on around you. You can sense the vibe in the room. You can sense danger. You can feel out good people and not so good people. You can, you also feel other people's pain and you empathize, it's emotional intelligence. So intuitive, a lot of times I'll say something, you know, when we walk in there, you know what he's gonna say? What, what's he gonna say? He's probably gonna say something like this. We end up walking in the room, the guy says it. <laughs> it's just amazing. That along with higher consciousness and the high level empath. For you to be able to say the things that you're saying at the depth that you're saying them, which also leads beautifully to your writing and feeling these stories. When you write, I know that you're not just writing words on paper. You're almost feeling their lives and treating them in a certain way, respectfully telling their story, uh, that you're feeling it as you're writing it. High level empath, intuitive, higher consciousness, uh, I think is probably the name of the game for James Gavin as well. Well, you said something. You didn't expect now. me to say that, did you? <laughs> oh, but I'm, I'm, I'm asking in it. When, when, you, when you mentioned the word why, the question, the single most important question a biographer can ask. And I would say then, what is why? Because why is the key into the other that a biographer has to have, which is empathy. You have to be able to put yourself in somebody else's shoes in order to understand why they lived the lives that, that they lived. And without that, you have no business writing a biography. I have to try and get inside the heads and hearts of the people that I uh, that I that I'm attracted to as subjects, and I think the reason that I choose any at all is because, well, I I think I have stories clues to my my own can't quite put my finger on what it is. But I feel that if I delve deeply in, enough into these people's lives, that that I can make a connection with them and maybe understand yes. my own life a little bit. Exactly. Exactly. That's amazing. Exactly. I find that being the case with my work in television and radio and 
that I'm always looking, even, even if the person is very stoic, very stern and very dry, and you know that there's an iron wall built around them and there's not much that they're going to say, they, I think with you and with me, they know that we're not there to destroy them, embarrass them, humiliate them. We're there to uh, encourage and, and maybe support or give them a space to be able to emote, to share. Because I've had people too, where I've interviewed people on television and we're in the studio. And this is somebody who's a, you know, a CEO of a fortune 500 or whatever, and comes in in the suit and, and very stern and stoic and professional and all those wonderful things. And it's a news setting anyway. So we're in that atmosphere, but by the time we're done, they're asking for Kleenex <laughs> and apologizing. Wow. And I'm like, no, 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 don't, there's no need to apologize. You shared some things that probably have been deep in and you've never been really given the space or the opportunity to express it. But how do you feel? Oh my God, I feel like a million bucks. I've never had this happen. And I'm sure you feel that or express that or experience that as well, because you're, you're, as you're telling stories and documenting things, you're giving space to it and you're treating it with care and respect and people can really sense that they sense that you're creating trust and a safe space and you're not there to just get the headline and that's it type thing. You're there for a particular purpose and you're, you're living it as you're telling it and you want to feel it. And I'm sure there's elements in every single person that you've written about that you've celebrated where you see elements of James in them. Yeah. Well, that's a very high compliment you've just paid me. And I thank you, Jim. If one were to take a harsh, uh, cold look at the subjects that I've written books about, you could say Chet Baker, beautiful, promising jazz trumpeter who became a junkie. You could say Lena Horn, icy, imperious, beautiful, always beautiful. But that word beautiful is multi-layered. There's been, and that was not hard as this is to believe. That was not an easy mantle for Lena Horn to carry. Uh, you could look at Peggy Lee and say sexy, seductive, um, swinging, crazy. And you could look at George Michael and say, this an extraordinarily, again, beautiful and privileged man, the biggest pop star uh, in the world at a certain point. And what happened to him? Why did his life spiral downward the way it, it did? You can take uh, a cold view of these stories, or you can try and answer that important question, why? Yes, exactly. Exactly. And you've been able to do that with these extraordinary uh, notables on levels that I think really resonate. I mentioned, you know, and that was just the short list when I was talking about some of the uh, admiration and feedback and accolades and awards and everything. People really enjoy your writing style and the attention to detail because they they're immersed in it they're they're I, I imagine oftentimes rooting even for them as they're reading the story and you know they're real page turners and and i think it's a beautiful thing that you've been able to capture the lives in the essence that you have what is it thus far and much more to come from you? Uh, and again, we're just talking about the books, but he, he's done lots more. I mentioned Vanity Fair, New York Times, all these other things. What is it about these particular celebrities slash historic figures in our lives that you gravitated to you or maybe in a way somehow found you in their way, even though they're not here anymore, um, that you had to tell the story in the way that you did. What is it about these particular people's lives that you, James, had to be the one to really tell the story in the beautiful way that you have? Well, every one of these subjects, every one of these stories 
was an incredible panorama of, of history. These are epic stories. And what makes a story an epic story is when the life lived becomes about much bigger things than just the life lived. When it resonates with history, when it influences things. Uh, the psychological complexity and the undercurrents of sadness in all these people, uh, people's lives really draws me in. I love a, a detective story, I guess. All of these books that I've written, it required enormous thought and, and deep research in order to try and again, answer the question, why? Why did it happen? Why did they reach the heights that they did? Why in certain cases did they tumble from those heights? What was it about them that brought in the element of self-destruction? What were the things that they were fighting against? Also, uh, um, the artistry of these, of all these singers is of a supremely high level. Peggy Lee's vocal artistry, Annalena's Horn's vocal artistry, George's, Michael's in a different way, and certainly Chet Baker's. Wow, it's, it's deep, man. It's really deep. I'll single out Peggy Lee for the moment because Peggy Lee is a singer of so much subtle psychological complexity and nuance that I listen to today to recordings that I listened to when I was nine and 10 years old. And I still hear things in them that I didn't hear before. Yeah. With these great singers, the older you get, the more you live and experience, the more you hear in these recordings, because these singers were very wise mm -hmm. artists, very wise human beings. And they were not, acting these songs they had if you if you were lena horn of course you had theatrical abilities but these people were singing their lives peggy lee didn't know how to sing a false note lena horn brought her baggage on stage with her every time she ever performed chet baker had his own very um, incomprehensible mystique about him that was rooted in a deep pain that was buried way down uh, deep underneath that. Again, he was considered to be a cool trumpet player, but the thing that makes cool work when it works is that there's a lot going on underneath that coolness. There are things burbling up that, uh, that there are flickers of darkness and flickers of pain and you can sense them without necessarily hearing them, if, if you know what I mean. So all of this stuff fascinates me greatly. And that is why I was drawn to these, these subjects, because I just, I, I, I heard them perform. I was deeply moved by what they did, and I wanted to figure out why. Your latest is, and we'll we'll go through uh, you know each of them because they are all incredible and they're all unique. Um, they're all celebrated artists, as you say, and and special in their own way. They brought different things. And what's cool about it is you've selected individuals who have made tremendous marks and have left, you know, indelible marks in our society and in the landscape of music and art and everything else. But each one of them is so incredibly different from the other and unique, though you probably noticed some threads, maybe some of it in their personalities, their, the way that they conducted themselves, whatever it may be, some thread, but yet the uniqueness is there. The latest being this work of art that everybody's talking about, that everybody has been raving about. Tell us about George Michael, A Life. And you know, I love the cover, even the font, the simpleness of it. And just, you know, there's a feeling that I get in just saying what I just said, George Michael, a life, not the life, this, with the, that, with the, 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 no guessing or, you know, precognitions of anything. It's just George Michael, a life, open it up, read it, dig in. Tell us about this one and congratulations, James. Thank you, Jim. That's, that book is the hardest thing I've ever done. 
Mm. More on that in a moment. I wanted to give George the dignity of letting his beautiful face and a simple title and stark cover artwork suffice because that's enough. That face and that name are enough. Uh, I could have racked my brain and come up with a clever title for that book or a cute title, but I just decided that I wanted to treat him the way you would treat the great literary figures, I suppose, and give him a serious look and give him a compassionate look because the last 20 some odd years of George's life were very tabloid worthy lives in which yes. the tabloids were on his ass constantly and he was handing them a lot of scandal to write about. And George, uh, in the latter phase of his life, became as identified for all of that as he did for music. But I wanted to restore some of the shine to this serious artist, serious singer, a writer of songs that are engraved on our hearts all these decades later. I wanted to restore some of the lost dignity to George because he deserved it. I know he's been described as an extravagantly gifted, open-hearted soul singer whose work was both pained and smolderingly erotic, a songwriter of true craft and substance, and of course his music swept the world starting in the 80s. What, he, and of course his fabricated image uh, that of the hyper macho sex guard loom large in the pop cultures of the day, but he also hid, you know, his uh, secrets as he went along in the beginning. What are some things that, what did you think of George Michael prior? What was your image of him as presented and performed? And what are some things and appreciations you had of him and that you learned about George Michael, the artist, George Michael, the man, upon penning this book. In George's white hot years in which most of the big hits happened, uh, my head was in a completely other place, Jim. I was listening to old music. I wasn't clued into anything of the moment. That's an almost completely accurate statement. Yeah. And what it took to spin my head around was an album that George made in 1990 five released in 1996 called older that flopped in the u.s it was number one in the uk but almost everything george did was number one there and that album for me it's like it's like a set of, of the songs are like diary entries and the, it is a melancholy uh heart uh it's, 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 a, it's an album, uh, a stoned sounding album because George was needed to be very stoned on pod in order to get through it. It's an album in which he basically tried to resurrect the soul of the love of his life, a Brazilian man named Anselmo who had died of AIDS only a year and a half into his relationship with George. And that loss, tore George Michael apart because he felt with Anselmo that an angel had visited him from on high and had just as, as suddenly been torn away from him. And that is the album that drew me in and made me determine one day to tell this man's story. That's so incredible, I tell you, because to have an album have such an influence on you like that, you know, and to be able to then take that feeling and go and with- And I might add to that, that by the way, was George Michael's favorite of all his own albums. That and was, it acquired, huh? It acquired the stature that it had always deserved. People, it took a while for people to catch on to it. There's a similar album. Peggy Lee made an album with, of Lieber and Stoller art songs in 1975 called Mirrors. And that album was excoriated when it came out. And with the passing of time, 
people caught on to the fact that that album was a masterpiece and they have done the same thing with George Michael's older. So how long did it take you actually to start with the idea and then bring the whole thing to fruition? You know, I often ask sometimes some writers will say that one of the hardest things is to put those first few words down on paper Others will say, knowing when it's finished, to put the last period on the last sentence is difficult. Others, we actually had somebody that said a couple of weeks ago, you know what I found the hardest, Jim? The middle, bridging the first part with the last part, and the middle was the most difficult for them. How about for you? What was the writing process like, James? Brutal. Every step of the way, it was like rolling a boulder up a hill. Jim. George died, which was Christmas Day of 2016. I got my contract about five months later, and it was a hard book initially to research because people were reluctant to talk to me. It was very hard to win people over. Eventually, I got most of the people that I needed but it was really a struggle. And I was also walking through, for me, uncharted land because I didn't grow up listening to 80s British pop. That was not my world. I had to learn a lot of George Michael's musical world from scratch. I had to really study it and read a lot about it and listen to a lot of music that I had not for most of my life paid attention to. And so it was hard. I'm glad I did it because in the end, I wrote the book that I set out to write and I feel that I told an honest story about George Michael. Was it tough to end it, to put the final sentence together? Do you ever find, like sometimes when I've done video work, and maybe it's work of tribute to somebody that is no longer with us. One of the toughest things for me is to is, is not getting started. It's when I know that I'm coming to the end and there are no more pictures and there's no more that I could add to it because that was it. You know, it, that there's just no more pictures or photos. There's no photos. There's no video. There's no, there's nothing more. And so knowing when to cap it sometimes for me is difficult. I'm not a good goodbye person anyway, so, <laughs> or an ending person, but how about for you when, when ending wrapping succinctly, you know, putting that period on that last sentence, how does that work for you? Is that easy for you? Is it difficult to you? You know, I'm sure you get it's emotionally wrapped up. It's a killer. It's a, it's a killer. Yeah. It's a killer. <laughs> Anything, I, book I've ever written. Um, why do you it, think it, that it, is? What is well, it about it? At a certain point, it is snatched out of my hands. and Otherwise, I'd hold on to it forever. Because um, Truman Capote once said, and I want to preface this by saying that I am in no way a glimmer. I, I am not a piece of gum underneath the shoe of Truman Capote. Truman Capote is one of my idols. But Truman Capote said in later years of In Cold Blood that there is not a sentence of that book that he would not have rewritten if he couldn't have done, if he could have done so. And I, 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 I give it the absolute best I can knowing that that, that I could rewrite every sentence in that book and make it somehow better. That is how I torture myself with these books because you want so hard for, you want so much for it to be, to use that word again, definitive. I set out to, to, to I have people's lives in my hands. And when I write one of these books, I want to, not only be fair and balanced and comprehensive and compassionate and all of these things that matter so much to me, 
but I want to tell this story. And so it is told. I, I set the goal for myself of telling it for all time. And so given the, that impossible um, plan that I set for myself, it's just torturous. And yet this is what I chose to do. And this is what gives my life meaning. This hard, hard thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I can relate. I know exactly. It keeps calling your name. It's a reflection of who you are. It, it, you know no other way. It's what you do and you have to do it. And since James goes through all the pain, gang, you don't have to. All you need to do is go to Amazon, et cetera, and get the book. He's already gone through the blood, sweat, and tears. He's taken the load off you, put it on himself as he was writing it. So now when you read the book, you will know what James went through emotionally just to be able to capture the story, uh, which I think is a beautiful thing. Well, Jim, I, I told you all of that because it's the truth. But right. in a way, I don't want it. Nobody else should have to worry about any of that stuff. I want to. I want to create. I want to draw people into a world they haven't seen before, and right. I want to hopefully right. give them something that they can that can touch them, that they can relate to, that they can perhaps see a little of them themselves in. I want to give these artists and these great lives they lived their due. I want to give back yes. to them a little of what they, they gave me. George Michael, a life explores the compelling story of a superstar whose struggles as well as his songs continue to touch fans all over the world. And you were able to capture it in such a beautiful way from that swaggering dominant half of the leading British pop duo in the 1980s, Wham! And then you detailed beautifully Michael's sensational solo career, the subsequent unraveling, of course, with this deep analysis of the creative process behind Michael's albums, the tours, the music videos, as well as many, many interviews with hundreds of his friends, his colleagues as well. And that's why people say it's a probing, definitive portrait of the pop legend. What you're saying is the reward for whatever troubles I experienced in putting this book together. I, there's no way of knowing when you're going through all that. There's no way of knowing how it'll turn out or how it will be received. And it's truly nerve wracking in the months leading up to publication when you're thinking, okay, God, will they like me? Will they like it? Will I be, will I be, um, uh, uh, decimated in the reviews, but it didn't happen, actually. All of that worrying that I did was in vain because this book has gotten gorgeous attention beyond anything that I had ever imagined. And it tells me, among other things, that people really care about George Michael more than I ever realized when I was writing that book. Do you? He went through a lot. And it always, it wasn't always pleasant and it wasn't always positive, but do you think overall people loved him and of course they miss him, but in the end feel sorry for him? They wish that they could have done something or wish that they could have noticed something or whatever the case may be, do you find that to be the case? And did you find it yourself that as you're interviewing, you know, friends, family, and, and getting all this information and you're learning about this individual, this iconic individual yourself, you make this invo emotional investment as the author, the journalist, the biographer, that can connect you to the person. Did you find yourself rooting for George, feeling sorry for George? What were some of the emotions you were left with upon telling his story and learning more about him? Well, of course, when I set out to write this, I knew what the ending was. I knew where it was all headed. Yeah. But I do firmly believe that nobody could have saved George. His impulse for self-destruction and his self-hatred was strong, and it grew with the years. 
And I don't think that George wanted to save himself, mm. sad as that may yeah. sound. But what I do want to stress, Jim, is that George Michael, in spite of all of that darkness in his life, he left us with an over an overriding sense of joy. Anytime yeah. that I've, meant, I've yeah. mentioned the name George Michael to people, they smile. You can see that that name alone brings happy associations for people. Isn't it wonderful that all of that is what won out over all the, the public mishaps and the embarrassments and the, the health issues and all of that stuff that was so heavily reported as it was happening? In the end, that is not what we're left with. Do you think he knew that? Do you think he felt that love, that adoration? Do you think not just, you know, for the music, but for the person, do you think he felt the impact that was made or, or not? He absolutely knew how loved he was. And unfortunately that could not penetrate the, he didn't love himself. He didn't like what he saw in the mirror. And unfortunately, nothing could shake that. No yeah. amount of screaming screaming of fans or um, uh, no amount of tremendous popularity could ultimately save him. It's terribly sad, but in the end, George Michael was loved. He was loved in every country of the world. He is as loved now, almost as he ever was in his absence, I feel. I agree. Yes, I agree. Um, the book available at Amazon, right? Uh, people can go to Amazon and elsewhere to get the book, George Michael, yeah. A Life. Again, it's uh, highly revered, acclaimed. Everybody's talking about this book, folks. And uh, James really put his heart and soul and a lot of time and effort in it. Uh, you will thoroughly enjoy it. And again, if you are a fan of the other wonderful person we've been talking about, Peggy Lee. <laughs> and I love the cover. I love that particular image of her. I love the black with the white lettering, the colors, the shadowing, uh, the font used for your name and hers. Is that all there is, which was always something, you know, that's a signature line from her music and from her life. Um, tell us about the draw to Peggy Lee. Whenever I hear Peggy Lee, there's a song that comes on at Christmas time when she sings Happy Holiday. Fantastic. Just her version. And I've heard a million other versions of it. Just the joyous way that she sings it. She could turn a phrase, she can make everything sound so warm, sexy, intriguing, buttery, just by saying hello. <laughs> what is it about Peggy Lee that attracted you enough to want to invest in telling the story? Just as the older album drew me into George Michael, an album that Peggy Lee made in 1972, her last Capitol album, and she knew it. She knew that it was over for her at Capitol. Norma Dolores Ekstrom from Jamestown, North Dakota, arranged and with the piano playing of Artie Butler, smashing musician from the West Coast. And that album is a sad album. And when I found it, that album was available for $1.99 in every Woolworths. It was a great, right. it was a great album. <laughs> It didn't. It hadn't sold the way the way it was the make or break album at the end of her capital contract. I used to go it's through like, those Woolworth bins too. <laughs> it, yeah, well, I, I a dollar ninety nine I could afford, and yes. that album, and that album I listened to. I have listened to it from the age of nine to the to 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 today, and that album touched me at such a deep level, Jim, that that I was hers. From that point on, I was hers. And I was obsessed with Peggy Lee and fascinated by her and intrigued by the mystery of Peggy Lee's singing and by the mystery in those eyes. And her singing worked on me in a way that, that hooked me 
for, for a lifetime and made me want to understand more about her. So it's very much the same as with my other books. I, I was so moved by the music and so intrigued by the intricacies of the personality and the question marks swirling around these people that I just had to find a way in to understand it better. Mm. You know, I like the way you say that. Uh, I mean, most people don't end up writing a book. You did, which I think is amazing, but so fascinated that it answered a lot of questions and brought you closer to these figures you've admired or, or learned about more by writing the book. And what a cool way to share this with the world so they can feel closer or maybe questions can be answered that uh, people have always pondered. But at the same time, also it, it has gifted you with the fulfillment of you know, learning more about their grace and who they are as people and not just as public figures, celebrities, you know, the stage images that are created and crafted and enhanced. And then sometimes somebody, their image is so crafted, like a Joan Crawford, that you almost don't know who the person is other than being a Joan Crawford who lived for, for that. Um, so with Peggy Lee, it's, you know, really incredible. Yeah. And you learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I love her more. I can say this of all my subjects. I love them and feel them more than I ever did before, because I know so much of what the struggle was that, that, yeah. enable them to create that music. And I also, speaking of Lena, I wanted people to understand what a great singer she was. I wanted people to understand what she went through. Yes. This, this, seemingly, this seemingly beautiful, obviously beautiful, see, seemingly privileged beyond imagination icon. And I wanted them to understand what, what, the struggles behind it that enabled her to sing the way she did. Exactly. Yes. Again, another one, folks, Stormy Weather, you'll want to get that. And uh, yeah, we're having a great conversation. Uh, James is going to scoot off in just a second here. We can go for a long time with James. We'll definitely have to have him back. There is Stormy Weather. You're going to want to definitely pick this up. Get them all, folks. <laughs> and uh, quickly, of course, this one too, Deep in a Dream Another one near and dear to your heart too, right, my friend? Deep in, that book will be the book that someday when I am looking back on my entire life, that book and the creation of that book is, is my most precious memory in life. And that book was also torture to put together, man. It was thrilling and terrifying and scary. And it, it, it made me crazy. Tr tracking that story down, traveling through Europe for a total of, I did two six weeks, six week tours throughout Europe, retracing Chet's steps and talking to the people that had known him. And it was an absolutely thrilling, hair raising experience that I, I'm again, I'm getting goosebumps as I think of what I could write a book about writing that book. Yeah. I'm very proud of the way yeah. it came out. It's a dark story, I have to warn yeah. you. And I decided yeah. that I had to go yeah. with it because that was the truth. That's what happened. There's black humor in it, but I wouldn't call it a day at the beach. That's why I called it Deep in a Dream, The Long Night of Chet Baker. Darkness, darkness. Darkness, darkness. And one other we want to slip <laughs> in here, Intimate Nights too, huh? Uh, the book that gave, that really did give me my life. That's the book that I, that I, that I set out to write as a 20 year old with no experience as a writer. I have not so much as published an article in a, anything other than a school newspaper, but I had this tremendous passion about old nightlife in New York, about the Manhattan that I wanted to someday live in. And that enabled me to live through a bygone era vicariously. 
and everybody was still alive, almost everybody who had been around in that book, I was able to interview firsthand. I did hundreds of interviews for that book. Most of those people are gone, and I am so grateful to whatever it is that pushed me on to write that book because I was able to preserve a piece of New York history that is me. Absolutely. Again, beautifully said and beautifully written, all of these incredible books. A uh, couple of quick things here. Jen Barry says, James, thank you for a fun night. Come back soon. Christine, uh, Jen was in Pennsylvania. Christine in North Carolina. I love Peggy Leeds. Hey, Good day, Fever. So many wonderful songs. I really like. I don't know enough about you. These books look fascinating. Uh, Sherry in Kansas, USA. Thank you, James, for being here and telling us all about your life and books. Your new books sound amazing. Please come back. We will keep the porch light on for James. He's welcome back anytime. Austin Field, another great show. Please subscribe. Excellent content. Thank you very much. Joan Sandow. James, thank you for spending a wonderful evening visiting Lovety Hall. I can't wait to read a life. It's been so interesting to share your passions with us. And we thank you very much. You. Wonderful evening. Um, what more would a person want? Fantastic host, amazing guest in our Lovities. Absolutely. And um, I have read... I've read every one of uh, Dear Ron D. Armand, my friend, for years. I have Fabulous. read every Glad one of enjoyed those it. comments. Every one of those comments as they scrolled by. Thank you all from the bottom of my heart for giving us your time and your attention tonight. And I have loved your company. It's been a pleasure, James. And George Burns, who pops on in the end, says his <laughs> love. And he said, you knocked it out you. of the park. He always pops in in the end. My aunt collected dolls and this came down to me, passed down. And George said, you knocked it out of the park. He learned so much. He knew most of the characters that we talked about tonight. And he sends you all the very best, my friend. I hope uh, the show met whatever expectations you had and you enjoyed the time with me as much as I absolutely have Jim, with you, James. Jim, I, Jim, I could have gone on for hours doing this. So let's do this again sometime. I love talking with you and I love being in the company of your viewers. You're the very best. Uh, continued blessings and joys to you and thanks for all the time. And we'll see you again soon, my friend, okay? Joyous. Thank you so much, Jim. You take care. Bye-bye now. <laughs> From Fire Island, New York. And uh, he had to scoot off. He had some other things that were popping up real quickly. Deadlines approaching. You know, he's always writing and creating. So we appreciate the time. And wow, what a great conversation. You know, we went, as we say, kind of like paying heed to Carson Cabot and some of the old school talk shows. We, we really treat this kind of like a TV show in a way. We... Um, do it with uh, a lot of fun and levity, warmth, inspiration. And we always learn something together. And wow, what a great array of books, huh? He's covered some amazing people in American, if not uh, international history in the musical world. As I mentioned, he's an acclaimed journalist, biographer, author. He writes for a lot of different publications, uh, and what I love is his stories about why he wrote the books. He didn't just, which a lot of people do, not everybody, but some people write a book because that person is trending, that person is topical, that per there's a scandal or something. He wrote those books because he wanted to learn more about these iconic figures. Isn't it amazing? And then by doing that, learned a lot more about these iconic figures, dug in deep, did the research, got attached to them in different ways emotionally, poured himself into it, and presents them to us in a way where you do feel like you're almost standing next to James as he's getting the information and as he's putting these um, pages together together and these words together. You know what I mean? You almost feel like you're as invested in these figures, these iconic people as he was in celebrating them in the way, you know, celebrating all and not just 
propping them up and dusting them off, which we all tend to do, especially when people are gone. Sometimes we do prop them up and dust them off and we forget about anything. But he really, in his books, gives you a full, well-rounded 360 on the person's life. He's not out there to, uh, you know, destroy them or tear them down. He's telling you the truth and what he's observed and what he's learned through all of the research and uh, the careful treatment of the individuals. Really cool stuff, huh? And he and I, you know, had an amazing conversation, which happens often here on the Gym Masters Show. That's why we don't call these interviews. We call them conversations. And you're aboard with us, interacting from all around the world. You have an opportunity to be a part of our show is our interactive virtual studio audience. That's what we do here. Uh, so great to have James Gavin with us here on the show. Very busy guy. He's really busy. He's got a lot going on because especially with the George Michael book, which only came out in June. So, you know, he's, he's hopping around. He's got a lot going on, but, uh, celebrating again, George Michael in the way that he did George Michael, a life. That's the latest book from James Gavin. Of course, is that all there is Peggy Lee and stormy weather, Lena Horn, And of course, Chet Baker deep in a dream. He has some wonderful Last minute stories there. And also Intimate Nights, another one, the golden age of New York cabaret. Iconic figures we were talking about from George Michael, and we were sprinkling in, you know, some photos along the way uh, as well. If this is your first time watching, welcome to the Gym Master Show Live. We've done over 750 shows live seven days a week. Some more shots of uh, George Michael, and we talked about Peggy Lee which was fantastic. I've always admired Peggy Lee and the incomparable Lena Horn, another treasure. Absolutely. You ever see there's a, if you can find the clip on YouTube, there's a fantastic short clip where Lena Horn is singing with Andy Williams on the Andy Williams show. And they're singing, um, have a great day. And it's really good. It's really, really, the two of them just, you know, it's going to be a great day. They're just really so good together. And uh, check that out. I think it's on YouTube or something, a clip of the Andy Williams show where Lena Horn was a guest on the show. There's also a really cool uh, thing on YouTube. I think it was the Julie Andrews show where Peggy Lee was a guest. It was one of the, maybe the Christmas episodes with Julie Andrews, or it was just one of the regular episodes of the Julie Andrews series, which was on CBS. And Peggy Lee was one of the guests on the Julie Andrews show. That is really iconic. Julie Andrews had a great series, as did Andy Williams. Many people did. Remember all those TV shows, um, those great specials where there was singing and variety and humor and intimate moments. So uh, look for those moments with the Julie Andrews show and the Andy Williams show. Andy singing with Lena Horne, Julie singing with Peggy Lee. Really cool stuff. And of course, we talked about Chet Baker, who another, you know, icon uh, in the music world. And in that book, um, he really covers it beautifully. So, you know, so cool to have James with us, huh? <laughs> And uh, he opened up too. you know, here we are talking about these iconic figures. James also opened up authentically and in a real fashion about his life, about his background, about his upbringing in New York City and about his family and about the things that have inspired him and sort of his uh, affinity for sad music and for feeling things. What's cool about that is as you read these books, now having watched this episode of the Gym Masters Show live series, I think it's going to give you a deeper appreciation, not only of his writing style and of the books themselves, but also of James, because you're going to almost, I think you're going to almost like feel James in a way as you're going to feel like his approach to these books and to other writings, if you find other writings of his, you're going to just get a certain vibe now because you've learned a lot more about James Gavin, the author, journalist, and biographer, not just 
the author who writes these books on popular people, but you know what he pours into it of himself. And I think that's fantastic. You know, you don't always get that um, when these things happen. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, you don't always, when you have conversations with people and quote interviews, you just get, tell us about the book. Where can we find the book? Congratulations on the book. Tell us, you know, something uh, titillating about the person and that's it. But it's a well-rounded thing that we do here at the gym master show. So this was cool. And, uh, thanks for uh, joining us too, gang. We love all of you. We thank James. You can find all the books at amazon.com. Just look for James Gavin. You'll find them all there. Here they are again, George Michael of life. And of course, uh, celebrating Peggy Lee is that all there is. And Stormy Weather, Lena Horn, and of course, Deep in a Dream, The Long Night of Chet Baker, and uh, Intimate Nights, The Golden Age of New York Cabaret, all there for you by James Gavin. Cool stuff. Thanks for all the great comments, folks. You guys are on fire. Thanks to everybody watching live. We also know we have a significant audience that watches our episodes later when they're archived, when you are able to watch them. Not everybody is always here when the show is live. We realize that. So we thank those of you who go the extra mile and can join us live and participate when the shows are live. But we also thank all of you who watch at your convenience, at your leisure, based on your time schedule uh, when the shows aren't live. However you do it, definitely give this episode and all the ones you like a thumbs up. That matters a lot to us, helps us continue to grow and know what you're enjoying here. So you'll see a thumbs up sign or a little thumbs up icon there on the YouTube channel next to every episode. Give us a thumbs up and uh, a like, and also subscribe to the YouTube channel. We would love that. There's a red button there you see. Doesn't cost anything. And when you do subscribe, you're a part of the JMS Lovety family. You're part of our Lovety squad, but also click the notification bell so you never miss any of our episodes. Uh, like last night, we had Loretta Sewitt on the show. Did you see that episode? That was fantastic. She and I had an unbelievable conversation, lots of laughs. If you didn't see when Loretta Sewitt was with us, she was amazing. Check that episode out. Tomorrow, Shelly Ray Speck is an extraordinary award-winning singer and songwriter. She's going to be with us tomorrow on the Gym Master Show Live. If you didn't see the episode when John D. Domenico, the extraordinary Emmy-nominated actor, comedian, and impressionist and writer was here, not only was he here, he brought along Austin Powers, Jay Leno, Donald Trump, Johnny Carson, Dr. Phil, Dr. Evil, <laughs> Ben Franklin, Regis Philbin, Sean Connery, and many others. It was a hilarious episode. You can see that on our YouTube channel. And that episode of the Gym Masters show right here on our YouTube channel, Gym Masters TV. So gang, uh, thanks for being with us here on the show. We appreciate all of you. And take a look at a few more comments before we wrap up. And uh, we'll be back tomorrow. And again, that's for those watching live. But for those of you who are watching Memorex, meaning that uh, you are watching this later on when we're not live, we thank you and uh, invite you to stay right here because another episode of our show comes right up. There's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of episodes that we've done with extraordinary guests and great conversations and poignant moments uh, for all of you. Let's take a look at a couple of the comments here in our JMS Lovety chat room, which is available to everybody who subscribes to our YouTube channel. And uh, this was great. Uh, Crystal, good to see you, Crystal. Glad you enjoyed it. Wonderful conversation, James. Uh, you had uh, James times two tonight, James Gavin and James Masters. <laughs> I say you can call me James, Jim, or Jimmy. Just don't call me late for supper. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Always great when you're here. Mary Bishop in the house from Florida. Wonderful show tonight with James. Must read books. Absolutely. I knew you guys would love it. And I'm sure you're clicking on Amazon already. And Christine Clifton in North Carolina. Lovely. Christine says, James, thanks for sharing more about your books. 
and opening up about your life. Tonight was a deep, meaningful conversation. That's right. That's what we do here on the Gym Master Show Live all the time, Christine, as you certainly know. And good to have you here. Same thing with Kathleen in New York City. Kathleen, hopefully you got a chance to see the Loretta Swit episode. Don't forget to leave a comment on our YouTube channel for all the shows you enjoy. And uh, glad you enjoyed this. Thanks for being here, James. Sherry Larson says, thank you, Jim. Wonderful show and fantastic guest. You are amazing and we appreciate all you do for us. The pleasure is all mine. The pleasure is absolutely all mine. Thank you, James. Thank you, Jim. You're very welcome, Pam. And uh, Jens in Allentown, Pennsylvania says, I like your shirt, Jim. Cool. Thank you very much. Appreciate that. Kathleen Walker in New York says, as always, thanks, Jim, for continuing to give us great shows. Thanks for all you do. The pleasure is all mine, Kathleen in New York City. Love doing it. Absolutely love doing it. We're getting ready to go on some big TV shoots. We're heading to Dallas, Texas, Reno, Nevada, Sacramento, California, Fort Lauderdale, Florida. That luggage is going to be flying through the air. Um, hope they don't lose it. <laughs> They did lose it when we were coming back from the shoot in Milwaukee. Uh, they lost it in Baltimore, mine and everybody else's, but we eventually got it. Uh, Kathleen Walker did a super chat. That's something you can do when the show is live. Super chat, super emoji, super stickers in the JMS Levity chat room helps support our series. And if you don't get a chance to do it when our shows are live, there is a little heart icon on our YouTube channel called Super Thanks. And that helps support everything that we do here at the Gym Masters Show live series. Have a great night. Good night, all, and hugs. Thank you, Kathleen, for the super chat. That means a great deal. We appreciate all of you who do that. That uh, goes the extra mile, and we we thank you so very, very much. And um, you guys are the best. And everybody's saying good night to everybody. Thank you very much, uh, Mary. Jen says, thanks, Jim. Another fun night. Thank you very much. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Christine Clifton, uh, thanks, Jim and James, for this uh, deep and wonderful conversation tonight. His books do seem so fascinating and special. His passion for writing and people, I'm sure, is felt in each book. Enjoyable show. Absolutely. And he and I seem to be kindred spirits in a lot of different ways. We think about people and, uh, you know, respect and kindness and all that other important stuff in life, you know. And I always say you got to laugh. You got to find the humor in life because life can be crazy and nutty and sometimes people can be as well. So you got to look for uh, a little humor in the situation. I always do. Uh, that's been passed down to me. <laughs> it has been passed down to me. Um, Jim, can you drop me off at the AT&T stadium? My Dallas Cowboys, Dallas Cowboys cheerleader. Yeah, we are headed to Dallas actually next week for a television multi-day television project. You want to come along? Um, let's see. I don't know. I, I don't know if we're, what, we'd have to, what, where would we find you in Philadelphia? Uh, you, Pittsburgh is too far from where you are in Allentown, right? You would have to, we would have to make our stop off in, cause we're coming from North of you. Uh, we would have to stop off in Philly, right. To pick, scoop you up in Philadelphia to bring you to Dallas when we head to Texas for our television shoot. Hmm. <laughs> And uh, you guys are great. Just taking a look at a couple more of these comments. And uh, I know you guys have been talking about how you love all the different things we've been talking about tonight. I agree, Pam. Very true. The eyes are the windows to the soul. Absolutely. Appreciate Austin Field being here. Another great show. Please subscribe for excellent content. Thank you, Austin. I appreciate that support as well. Pam has always loved Woolworths and Woolco. I know, long gone, right? All those stores, Grants, Woolworths, Corvettes, S. Kleins, Zare, Keldor, Bradleys, all those stores, those department stores, those more sort of mid-range affordable department stores. Um, I know they're all gone. There's only, I don't know if there's any left really. There's just, you know, Walmarts and, and Targets and everything else. All right, gang, thanks for being with us. We had a good time with James and a good time with all of you. Find all of his material on uh, Amazon so you can get all those great books and uh, sink your teeth in and enjoy. And don't forget, if you enjoyed this episode, 
please do leave a comment on our actual YouTube channel, right underneath the channel. Leave a comment for us. Give us a thumbs up. We would really appreciate that. All right. You guys are the best. We don't say goodbye around here. We say, see you later. Ciao. Cheers. Shalom. Hasta la vista. Avida Zain. Moi loop. Take care. Be well. Sayonara. We'll see you on the next one. Jim Masters here thanking you for your time this time. Till next time, Linda Odell in San Augustine, Florida says, thank you, Jim, for another great show. You are the best. Thank you, Linda. We appreciate you being here on our Entertainment Lifestyle Variety Talk Show series. Always have a good time with all of you as well. So we'll be back tomorrow. Check out past episodes you may have missed. They're all archived for you on our YouTube channel. And uh, love having all of you here. It's always a blessing. Take care. As we always say, be good to one another. Take care of one another. That's something I always try to remember to say. I got to remember to do it myself. Take care of myself. Take care of one another. Love one another. And be good to yourself. Take time for yourself as well. Really important to do that. I have to remind myself to do that sometimes too, as I'm always telling the world, take care of yourself and look out for yourself. I got to remember to do that sometimes too, um, as well. So Christine pops in and says, yes, Jim and James had more in common than your name, our names. I think kindred spirits for sure. Absolutely, Christine. You're spot on with that. Spot on with that. All right, gang, you be well, okay? Subscribe, like, comment, do all that other fun stuff. It helps us out. Spread the word about our show. Share the links on your social media as well. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook, all at Gym Masters TV as well. And our group, of course, uh, the Gym Masters Show Liberty Hall on Facebook and all the other places. Uh, you guys take care. We'll see you on the next one and uh, be well. Thanks for being with us. It's good hanging with you here on another great episode. Another 700 and whatever, hundreds of episodes. I'm losing count of how many shows we've done. But however many we've done, as long as you're here, that's what matters. That's what makes it all worthwhile. Be waiting here for the next one. You take care, all right? Be good to yourself, and uh, I'll be waiting for you. As uh, Richard Marks said, I'll be right here waiting for you. You are loved, Jim. Kathleen Walker in New York City, thank you very much. I appreciate that. And Kathleen, wasn't that old timers day at City Field fantastic on Saturday? They, the New York Mets brought back, and they hadn't done it. I didn't realize it was until, it's been 30 years. It's been since 1994 that the New York Mets had not had an old timers day. Uh, bringing back the originals. They brought back Ed Crane Pool and I mean, everybody who was anybody. It was incredible. Uh, it was, you know, Mookie Wilson and they did a nice tribute to Willie Mays. And you were there, Kathleen, because you work at City Field with the Mets. And uh, if I wasn't on the air, I had a TV shoot on Saturday morning, a news television news shoot. And then I had our night show as well. So I uh, couldn't be there. I would love to have been there for the old timers day. But um that was a nice tribute and uh, Piazza was there and uh, really cool stuff. Really cool stuff. All right, gang, for the 30th time, we will see you on the next one. Okay. We're not good. Goodbye people around here. So we just say, see you later. Thanks for being with us on the gym master show. First time with us, join us again. Been with us since the beginning. Thank you very much. Take care and be well. Cheers. <laughs>